Good evening. Thank you very much for coming, and a big thank you to Lee for agreeing to come and perform on, our, on this lovely organ, which unfortunately we don't play it enough, I don't think. Um, but thank you very much for coming out, and in, it is in relation to our 300th anniversary. Park Road Baptist Church is 300 years old this year, and we are having, as you can see, a big celebration weekend at the end of September. So, um, Just a few housekeeping things before we get going. Um, the fire exits, we're not expecting any fire alarms, so if it does go off, it is because it's a real thing. So the uh, doors are the ones you came through or either side here. Um, toilets are through this door and then up the corridor on your left. And then at the interval, I think it says tea and cake, but actually it will be cold drinks and cake. <laughs> but at least it'll be refreshing. Up in the hall, which is straight up the corridor, go as far as you can and you'll come into the hall and we can use the outdoor area as well. So I'm just going to hand over to Lee. You've got the program and I think he will sort of talk you through a few bits as well.
<laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was Elgar's Imperial March of 1897. On the programme in front of you, you'll see quite a few of the dates are emboldened. And that's either because they have the date 1722, 1822, 1922, 2022, or the slightly odd one, 1897. So anything from 1722 relates to the year in which this church um, community was founded. And then 100 years after that, 1822, 200, 300. 1897 is particularly important because it's when this organ came into being uh, here in Northamptonshire, first at Nusson Lodge and then here in the church that's on this site. So 1897 was when this organ was built and put together, a, a local instrument but also an unusual instrument incoming from North America. 1897 also the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria, so in our own Jubilee year it seemed an appropriate place to start. The second piece on the program goes right back to 1722 when, as I say, this church community was founded. Johann Ernst Bach II, one of something like 20 or so Bach composers, not the very famous one, J.S. Bach, not the second most famous, C.P.E. Bach, not the third most famous, W.F. Bach, but maybe about the seventh or eighth most famous Bach. He was the son of Johann Bernhard Bach, another composer, who was the second cousin of Johann Sebastian. And this Bach, Johann Ernst Bach II, was a pupil of the real one, Johann Sebastian Bach. There, we've got it right. Um, his fantasia and fugue is more classical in style than you would anticipate from the Bach you perhaps know best. Um, but there are those, those hallmark tonal um, uh, shifts that you get in Johann Sebastian Bach's music. So it feels at times like it's treading Mozart's water, and at other times it feels like it's stepping Bach into Bach. Um, the great thing about fantasia and fugues and preludes and fugues, you'll see them all the time in organ recitals, toccata and fugues, is that you effectively explore two different things. In the fantasia, you're exploring line, melody, tunes that stop and start and weave in in each of other. Whereas when you get into the fugue, a much more formal process happens where the very short, very crisp melody starts to be played against itself, a bit like um, a very elaborate version of a canon or a round. And so you hear these beautiful harmonies. So in the first half, there are lines and melodies, and in the second half, it's the harmonies you're looking out for. It lasts about seven minutes, and then I'll come to talk to you again. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed. I'll give you the next three without any more talking. All of them have got something of a French theme. I've just returned from a little holiday in France where I was delighted to stay in montfort la maurie uh, the village that Ravel made his home for the last 20 years of his life, and less delighted to find that his museum and house were shut for the summer. So we were there 100 yards away but couldn't get through the door. There you go. Uh, Francis Jackson was organist at York Minster for 36 years and died earlier this year, 2022, at the age of 104. He was obsessed, maybe obsessed is not the right word, he was a lifelong admirer of Ravel. His house in Acklam, near Malton in Yorkshire, had a converted garage that he'd turned into a music studio, which had a grand piano, a two-manual organ, and it was all modelled on Ravel's studio, so it was all built with the same dimensions. It's one of the reasons I wanted to go and visit in France myself. And this reverie written in homage to Ravel, uses a melody that Ravel had written for Dupre to um, uh, improvise on in Saint-Sulpice. So it's, a, it's a, just a theme that Ravel left behind. Um, from Ravel, we go to Théodore Dubois. Uh, I'm typo here. Uh, he didn't write the piece in 2022. He wrote it in 1922. Um, <laughs> Uh, that would have been quite a remarkable feat otherwise. Um, Dubois was a student of Franck, who you'll hear of a little bit later. And Franck, Dubois and Faure founded the Société Nationale de Musique in, um, in Paris, which became the real um, workhorse of generating the French symphonic style in the 20th century. And that actually became something of a problem because Dubois was quite the conservative. He set up this society for the promotion of French music. And before he knew it, there were the composers Debussy and Ravel. And he didn't like these modernizations at all. And in fact, in 1904, he, he single-handedly stopped Ravel from winning the big European composition competition, the Prix de Rome. So it was a sort of two-edged sword. He set up this um, society to continue French music and it became all very modern. He didn't like it, so he tried to close it all down. So we've got uh, Francis Jackson on a theme of Ravel, then we've got Dubois, and then Dubois' colleague in setting up that society, Gabriel Faure, the ever-popular uh, movement from the Dolly Suite. So I'll give you these three in one chunk, the Jackson, then the Dubois, then the Faure. Dolly, by the name, was the name of the daughter he had with his fourth mistress. <laughs>
Thank you very much indeed. Now, the major piece in the first half is coming next, and this is César Franck's Fantasy in uh, 1878. The Trocadero was built in Paris on the opposite side of the Seine from the Eiffel Tower on the hill there, this great big auditorium, this great big concert hall for one of the world's fairs that happened in uh, Paris during the 1800s and early 1900s. And this huge, um, well, huge in scale, but quite small, 66 stop, three um, uh, manual cavalli col was built for the concert hall. And César Franck, who was the leading organist at the time, famous for writing Parnis Angelicus, uh, and also famous for being Belgian. Uh, the, it, pop, pop, pub quizzes, name a Belgian composer, César Franck. There you go, there's your money for you. Um, uh, the big light at the time in, in symphonic organ music that fitted the symphonic organ that he had available at the time. This fantasy is part of these three pieces. The first you're going to hear now, the second the cantabile, and the third pièce arique you'll hear in the second half. And the themes that you hear in this next 15 minutes come up again in those two pieces. So what you hear now will be transformed in the second half in very different ways. It's quite a sprawling and amorphous work. It's a, a little bit like nailing jelly to a wall to get it to make sense. But it makes sense when you hear the pieces in the second half. So the themes that sort of appear and disappear will be developed properly then. Um, it's ideal for this organ, this symphonic sounding organ, in every regard other than the fact that it's in A major. You are waving a fan miraculously over there. If you could wave it in front of the organ, that would be marvellous, because like all living, breathing things, it's found this summer something of a trial. Um, most organs, most natural, real organs, as we call them, are made of leather and wood and glue and elastic bands and sallotape, and the hot weather does them no good whatsoever. So occasionally you might hear this very low drone. It sounds like an underground train's coming beneath. That's where a note's got stuck. I'll do my best to remove it as it goes along, but if there's a little hiatus and you'll hear the wind drop, and then come back up again, you'll know that I'm just fixing a little problem as we go along. So this is César Franck's Fantasy in A, without me trying to play any of the low A's that cause it to go wrong.
Thank you. So those very amorphous, weird sections going from one place to another, not really sure where you're at. This kind of voyage through a mystery landscape with the sat-nav turned off. Second half, it'll all become clear. But for now, just before we hit our soft drinks and cake, three short pieces by Martin Howe, another composer who sadly died uh, ooh, uh, about six weeks ago, seven, eight, nine weeks ago, something like that now. Um, for many years, the leading light in the Royal School of Church Music in the south of England. Um, if you've ever seen a, a, an Anglican Church of England choir, when they wore the boys and girls wore those blue, light blue ribbons and then dark blue ribbons and red ribbons, that was all his invention to try and get more boys at the time singing, something that's sadly very much on the decline nowadays. Um, a great champion of church music in the south of England, both there and also at what's now called Croydon Minster. Three short pieces by him from a, a set of pieces called Contrasts. Um, very short, very snappy. Festivo does what it says in the tin. Reverie, our second reverie of the evening, another sort of winsome sort of piece. And then Hilarite, which was an, an uh, Easter carol text. Um, that was uh, fairly familiar in the early part of the 20th century, which sends us on our way to, um, well, refreshments. Thank you. Thank you. 
we've just seen the refreshment ladies go, so I think if you'd like to make your way along the corridor all the way through into the hall at the top end, and the uh, quad will be open if you'd like to go outside as well. Thank you very much. That was William Herschel's Allegro. William Herschel, the German-British astronomer, famous for discovering Uranus and the first ever president of the Royal Astronomical Society, also something of an amateur composer and rather talented, uh, if that offering is anything to go by. We're straight back now to César Franck. He of... which country is he from again? There we go. We've all, every, day is an, every day is a learning day. Yeah, you're from Belgium, and this is his Cantabile, the second of these three pieces. So those discombobulated themes now start to um, put together into something of a more coherent form. Cantabile means in a sort of singing style, very legato, very beautiful. And the melody is rather like the love duet from Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. And after that, I'll go straight from that into the next place, Parade of the Tin Soldiers. If you're of a certain vintage, you'll recognize it, and that dates you. <laughs>
did say I was going to go straight into the next piece, but I remembered something I hadn't said. Um, so, like all living, breathing things affected by temperature, we're getting these little snags at the bottom end a little bit, reminded me one of the memorable times I, I played that piece at my grandmother's funeral, which was about um, 15 years ago in a Methodist chapel in Nuthallerton. And I'd not been there before. She'd stopped going to church long before uh, I was born, uh, but um, still had the funeral service there. And I arrived to discover this, that piece is in B major, that all the C sharps, the D sharps, and the F sharps weren't working. <laughs> So I said, oh, oh, no, what am I going to do? And I played it down a bit, and it sort of worked. Um, and the Parade of the Tin Soldiers was one of her favourite pieces. Um, uh, my parents, I think it would be fair to say, aren't particularly musical. Um, but my mother's mother, the grandmother whose funeral I played for, was a piano teacher. Uh, and she had a sort of home theatre cinema organ in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the downstairs living, well, in the living room. And um, next to it was another theatre organ, which my granddad played. Um, she played entirely by music, he played entirely by ear. So that you could play something, he could put a TV theme and he could just play it, but he couldn't read music. She could only do it if they read music. So between the two of them, they had all kind of bases covered. Anyway, it was just in my mind.
Thank you. Now, the next, the next two pieces will go straight from one to the next. Well, next three, sorry. Um, Sibelius, going back to the dates again, 1922, a very special year in Sibelius's life. Those who know me know that Sibelius is a particular passion of mine. Um, 1922, he writes this Andante Festivo for string quartet. It's not especially festive. It's a slightly weird title, but it was a slightly odd commission. Uh, Sibelius, throughout his life, was, um, was always concerned a bit being penniless. He was generally concerned about being penniless because every penny he got, he spent on alcohol, uh, which meant that he was pretty penniless. Um, there was one famous occasion, he'd been um, on mainland Europe, so he's from Finland, he'd been on mainland Europe with his friend Alexei Galen Kellerler, the painter, and he, they'd basically kept themselves going by him writing these kind of um, parlor pieces for piano. He'd write a parlor piece for piano, send it to Breitkopf and Hertel, they'd publish it, send him 100 Deutschmarks, they'd spend it, and then the next week he'd write another piece, and then round and round and round it would go. Um, but uh, he basically ran out of energy for writing these novelettes, these like sending rustle of spring, that sort of thing, you know, kind of nice, kind of tuneful little pieces. He ran out of energy for doing it, decided to come home to Finland, where his wife had been waiting for a number of months. But they ran out of drink on the way home, so he sold all of his clothes <laughs> to finance the last drink for the ferry journey back, meaning that the only clothes he had left were white tie, you know, white bow tie, white waistcoat, black tailcoat. So he wore that for the entire journey back and arrived home in his white tie saying, hello, I'm back, and I've sold all my possessions. Anyhow, constantly worried about being penniless. So always took the most unusual commissions. His symphonies didn't really make him much money. They made him prestige later on in the violin concerto too. Um, but he was always, always worried about Murray. Th I wrote this down because I couldn't quite remember the details. He wrote this uh, string quartet he was originally commissioned to write a choral cantata for chorus and orchestra to celebrate the 25th anniversary of a sawmill on the island of Sanya Satslo, which is a tiny little island just off the south uh, east coast. Now, how do you write a big choral and orchestral piece to celebrate the 25th anniversary of a sawmill? Well, the answer is you don't. You write a little string quartet and you say, there you go, you've had something. And I think he gave it this title, Festivo, to try and please the commissioner. But the commissioner wasn't happy because it, it wasn't this big celebratory cantata all about the joys of wood. Um, nevertheless, this piece is so beautiful. And uh, in uh, 1939, on New Year's Day, he conducted, a, Sibelius conducted a performance of it which is the only known performance we have of Sibelius conducting his own work that was recorded. So this comes down to us, if you go into YouTube, you can hear it. Incredibly slow, incredibly carefully played. Tons of wrong notes in the orchestral part. The, the orchestra play wildly out of tune at one point, but it's just a beautiful evocation of very grand Finnish landscape. We go from there to Bender, an, an unusual composer, a bohemian, worked his entire life in Bohemia, so has sort of two, two names. There's this Yiri Antonin, which is if you think of it in Czech terms, but he's also known as Georg in the German side of things. Beautiful little sonata. That takes us right back to 1722, the, the, the 300th anniversary. And then the third piece, the arabesque by Carson Kuhlman. Carson's a composer um, who, was, who was born in... Um, mm can't remember, in New Haven, Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut, but has spent his entire life at Harvard University. He went there as a student, has never left. He is prolific beyond belief. This piece is... Now, now you, you have to look at the detail on the program. He was born in 1982. This piece is Opus 1465. 1,465, and they're not all small pieces. Some of them are operas and enormous pieces. He's just, just incredibly prolific. This arabesque was written about seven weeks ago. So as far as I know, it's not been performed in England yet. So it's at the European premiere, and I thought it'd be good, as this church is celebrating its birthday, that we have a piece from this year, as well as 1822 and 1922 and 1722. So this is Carson's arabesque. So you'll have the Sibelius evocation of these grand Nordic forests, then the Bender Sonata, back to the 17, early 1700s again, somewhat like Mozart or very, very, very early CPE Bach, and then the Carson Kuhlman Arabesque. Thank <laughs> you. 
And so to the final piece on the programme, the final of César Franck's Trois Pièces for Grand Orgue for the Trocadero in 1878. This is the piece that really made his name as an organ composer. He'd been known as an organ performer, known as a symphonist, the amazing symphony in D minor. Also the composer of a number of very, very successful operas and ballets that don't get done quite so much today, but probably not very well known during his lifetime for Parnis Angelicus, but after his life it's been a whole different story. This piece era week is, is symphonic and it's romantic and it's cataclysmic and I hope that the organ will sustain whatever I throw at it in the next seven minutes. And if it doesn't, well, I'll be kind. Um, is there a retiring connection? No? Oh, well, how marvellous. Maybe at some point you might like to send a church a little donation. That'd be marvellous. Uh, they, all, all these things are always most welcome. The, the supplies of blue tack and sellotape to keep these notes working uh, don't, don't come at an inconsiderable expense. So anything you can do to help in that regard. Um, I hope you've enjoyed tonight's programme. Uh, things from three different centuries, rather very specific thing, trying to find pieces that have connections to 1722, 1822, 1922, 1922, and of course the 1897 date. Um, and I hope you've learned a little bit about uh, César Franck, who is from... Well, there you go. If nothing else, it, it makes a change from watching the telly, doesn't it? Lovely. Thank you. Here's P.S. Era Week.
Wow. I think, um, yes, there's not a lot you can say to that. I mean, apart from the fact that we are in possession of a rather magnificent organ, I think, and it's um, something that should be played a little bit more than it probably is. Thank you, Lee, for coming over and doing this for us. For putting up with our temperamental organ, um, those of you who were here on Sunday would have heard what sounded basically like something from a sci-fi film coming out from one note, which was quite horrendous. So then a sort of few sleepless nights and a few early mornings in the church trying to get it to work and a few, lots of prayers, shall we say, um, has managed to finally get it to this stage. And so thank you, Lee, for putting up with it. Um, thank you also to Sally, who I know being a page turner is a horrendous task. So thank you, Sally, for coming over. You may have all no also noticed in the programme that Lee is shortly to start on a new career path. Um, I've known Lee for a few years. I think he actually probably doesn't realise this, but he accompanied my daughter in an, in an exam. I'm not going to tell you what happened on that um, accompaniment. She managed to do it unaccompanied. Um, and so I am sure that you'll join with me in wishing Lee all the best. He was talking to me uh, during the interval and he says he starts in September and it sounds quite a lot of work because it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday in uh, Cuddleston, Cuddleston, yeah. Cuddleston, however they say it down there. Then back to, back to the Northamptonshire, and then here, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, oh, he gets a day off, and then Sunday in church. So it's a full-on job, so I'm sure you'll join with me in wishing him all the best for that. Um, yeah. Thank you also to the ladies who very kindly did the refreshments, and for Graham and Diana for being on the door tonight. And thank you also for coming to listen to this and to share this magnificent organ with us. And it's something that hopefully we shall be able to do a little bit more in future. We will be playing it more. We will make sure it's played. As I say, it was not good last week. So, so have a safe journey home. And thank you very much again for coming. And thank you, Lee.